Good afternoon. I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding. Our guest today is one of the most compelling figures of the last decades of the 20th century and the first decades of the 21st. She is rightly known as one of our most outstanding secretaries of state and as well, I should add, as being the first woman to ever hold that office. Whether in or out of office, she has also been one of the nation's most tireless, dedicated and effective public citizens, a tough and relentless advocate for American values and American interests, she has been a beacon for democracy and human rights around the world and a clear voice of conscience in some of the most difficult international situations we have faced. Madeleine Corbell Albright is a native of Czechoslovakia and yet her story is profoundly American. As a child, she was twice a refugee, first from Hitler, in whose concentration camps three of her grandparents perished, and then from Stalin when the Iron Curtain fell. The daughter of a distinguished Czech dipl Czechoslovakian diplomat and an international affairs scholar, her early years saw her move from a fine embassy residence to a small rented house in Denver. Dr. Albright received a bachelor's with honors from Wellesley and as lots of college students from excellent schools find out every year, she learned how to start from the bottom. Her first jobs were as a cub reporter for the Rolla, Missouri Daily News, writing obituaries, articles for the society pages, and as she notes in her autobiography, interviewing people who had spotted UFOs. <laughs> Later, she worked picking pictures for Encyclopedia Britannica. Eventually, she returned to graduate school, earning masters, a master's and a doctorate degree from Columbia from the Department of Public Law and Government, and she settled into raising three daughters and a vigorous life of volunteer work. At the age of 39, 15 years after her last job at the Britannica, she was hired as Chief Legislative Assistant to U.S. Senator Edmund Muskie, and the beginning of her extraordinary career in public affairs began. Within just a short time, she was the head of legislative affairs for President Jimmy Carter's National Security Council. Later, she was foreign policy advisor to 1984 vice presidential Democratic candidate Geraldine Ferraro and then 1988 presidential candidate Michael Dukakis. She was president of the Center for National Policy and after the 1992 election of Bill Clinton was confirmed as permanent representative to the United Nations. In, the, in 1997, she was confirmed by the U.S. Senate as the 64th Secretary of State, ascending to a post held by Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, a certain Dartmouth graduate named Daniel Webster, George Marshall, and Dean Acheson. There are no easy times to be Secretary of State, but Secretary Albright's tenure was notably challenging, and she faced conflicts in the Balkans and Iraq, terrorist bombings in Africa, a bulky Middle East peace process, and the work of shaping post-Cold War Europe. Challenges remain in many of those areas, but it is a testament to Secretary Albright's achievements that those years now look relatively halcyon compared to some of the problems we face today. And the inbox she left her successor was but a fraction of what was left eight years later to Secretary Hillary Clinton. It's worth noting as well that Secretary Albright was one of the very few secretaries, perhaps the only one, who was offered a promotion when she left office. But she declined her friend Václav Havel's kind offer to make her or help make her president of the Czech Republic and resume private life in Washington. Since leaving office, Secretary Albright seems, if anything, and if it is physically possible, to have accelerated. She is now chair of the Albright Stonebridge Group, one of the world's foremost international strategic consulting firms and professor in the practice of diplomacy at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. She chairs both the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs and the Pew Global Attitudes Project and serves as president of the Truman Scholarship Foundation. In nine years, she has written five New York Times bestsellers, enough to bring envy to the most prolific of us. 
These include Madam Secretary, a memoir from 2003, memo to the president, how, can we restore, how we can restore America's reputation and leadership from 2008, and most recently, Prague Winter, a personal story of remembrance and war, 1937 to 1948, which was published in 2012. In that same year, 2012, Secretary Albright received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor from President Obama. When she is not on a plane or at a podium, she is doing something in some ways even more remarkable, supporting and developing the community of foreign policy practitioners in Washington and around the country. Everyone knows well Harry Truman's quip that if you want a friend in Washington, buy a dog. But as someone who has benefited immeasurably from her wisdom and her friendship, I can say that President Truman never knew Secretary Albright, who has been an advisor and a friend for me and many others, who have served in or around government in recent years, and her presence here is a testament to that kind of friendship. Believe me, this sort of generosity with time and support is not the norm out there, and there's a generation of us who are profoundly grateful to Madeleine Albright for her leadership and especially for her friendship, and it's now a great pleasure for me to welcome Secretary Madeleine Albright. Ambassador Benjamin, I would uh, like to thank you for telling everybody who I am, because not everybody always knows. Uh, <laughs> not long ago, I was coming back from China, and Chicago was the first port of entry, and I was there getting undressed for the security people. And I put my stuff down on the conveyor belt, and the lady uh, behind me said, so where'd you get all those screw-top bottles? My bottles all leak. I said, well, I got them at the container store. And then I was going through the magnetometer, and the TSA guard looked at me, and he said, oh, my God, it's you. <laughs> uh, and he said, I'm from Bosnia, and we all love you in Bosnia, and if it weren't for you, there wouldn't be a Bosnia, and you're welcome to come to Bosnia. And then he said, can I have my picture taken with you? So we stopped the whole line. It's a complete mess. I go back to get my stuff, and the lady of the screw-top bottle says, so what exactly happened here? And I said, well, I used to be Secretary of State, and she said, of Bosnia? So... <laughs> So thank you for straightening that out. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I could, and um, <laughs> I'm also glad you were a Secretary of State here. Um, so you are um, notably adorned in green, and you have... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in the sense of connections and not of uh, neckwear, you have lots of Dartmouth ties. Um, Perhaps you'd like to review those. I would. Uh, I'm delighted. And I have to say, I'm a Dartmouth mother. Uh, my daughter is the class of 1983. Uh, she was the goalie of the ice hockey team. She has many varsity letters from Dartmouth. Uh, and she was a very proud alum. She also was part of the Tucker Program Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, which is what directed her to the law. She is now a judge. So. Uh, and I was also asked to give the commencement speech here, and I have come up a number of times, notably sometimes during the New Hampshire primary. So uh, <laughs> I, I have been back and forth. It's a fabulous school, and I'm delighted that you asked me to come. Oh, well, we're delighted to have you here, too. And judging by that, uh, by that reception, I'd say you're something of a rock star in the Upper <laughs> Valley. Well, um, if only we could continue talking about such pleasant things as the college. but. Um, uh, we meet at a rather vexing moment, I'd say, in international affairs. And um, we probably should plunge right in because you've been talking about this a lot in the public. Um, I think you've used the word game changer to describe what has happened uh, in the Crimea and Russia's intervention there and the continued uh, perilous state of, a, of a affairs in Ukraine. And I was wondering if you wanted to give us your view of that situation, its lasting impact, and what we ought to be doing about it. Yeah. 
Well, I think it is a truly serious situ situation and a game changer in the following way. Um, if I could just take a few moments sure. to answer it. I think that uh, I had spent my whole life being uh, what was known as a Soviet expert. Um, I was somebody that spent time doing content analysis by looking at Pravda and his Vestia to see if five words were in different order or um, whether the portraits in the Kremlin were different. And one of the great amazing parts was to be present at the time that the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, and it was something that the first President Bush had to deal with. Um, with and he is the one <clears throat> who actually said that we wanted to have a Europe that was whole and free. And then President Clinton came into office, and the question was how to operate. And we were asked to do something that had never been done in the history of the world, which is how to devolve the power of your major adversary in a respectful way. Uh, you can defeat your adversary on the field of battle, but I happen to believe that we didn't win the Cold War. They lost the Cold War. Uh, and that's not just a semantic difference, because the place fell apart. And so the question was how to treat them well and, and respectfully. And so that's why we created the G8, uh, why, in fact, uh, we helped in a financial crisis. We tried to figure out how to bring them into the international system. And one of the things that we did decide to do was the countries that had been part of Central and Eastern Europe um, had been stopped from being part of a Europe that was whole and free. And so, in fact, we decided to expand NATO. And I went to see President Putin about it. And he said, you don't need NATO uh, because this is a new Russia. And I said, Mr. President, it is a new Russia, and this is a new NATO, and you can be a member of it. So it was not something that was done against them. It was something that many of us felt was justified because of the way that the World War II had ended. So, we spent a lot of time trying to bring Russia into the system. That was the whole thing, to make them part of it. And uh, so what has happened is that the game change, all of a sudden, is that Putin has decided, he has his own version of history, by the way. He makes up facts. That's what they do in the KGB. So um, the bottom line is that he is living in his own uh, set of facts. And, uh, and he sees a Europe that is whole and free as being anti-Russian, which it is not. And he specifically has focused on Ukraine. Ukraine is a very complex country. It is a neighboring state. Uh, and Crimea is, is a complicated history. There probably were ways to change. There, we've changed borders in countries as a result of negotiation. Invasion is not the way to do it. And I think the thing that makes it a game changer is that this is not the kind of behavior that we thought might be able to work in the 21st century, and trying to figure out whether there's any way to work with Putin's Russia. Because a lot of the people in Russia also want to be a part of Europe, and Putin has identified himself with an anger um, by some nationalists in Russia in terms of what's happened to Russia's identity. And just the last thing, in 1991, uh, I was uh, teaching at Georgetown and in, in the center, and we went to do a, um, a lot of survey work all over Europe, including in Russia, and we had focus groups. And there was this one focus group that I'll never forget where this man stands up and he said, I'm so embarrassed. We used to be a superpower, and now we're just Bangladesh with missiles. And the bottom line is the Russians, it's a head case. I mean, psychologically had lost their identity. And I think Putin has bought into that and he is trying to present a larger kind of a nationalist Russia that can have pride in its history. And I think they need to have pride in their history, but it doesn't mean that they have to dismember Ukraine. I think of you as a person who's brought a lot of wisdom from uh, the 20th century into, state, into statecraft today, and certainly that played a big part in you're thinking about uh, the Balkans in, in, the, uh, in the 1990s. When you look at someone who is using a myth of sort of a stab in the back, as Putin has been using about the West and the period after the collapse of the Soviet Union, has been playing on uh, ultranationalism, has been upholding himself as uh, the keeper of uh, 
of uh, a certain kind of civilization, a Russian civilization, it makes me very nervous. And, and uh, I'm wondering to what extent you feel like we're, be we're seeing a replay of something uh, very pernicious that we've seen before. Well, I'm very nervous always about historical analogies. And what I always tell my students is really important to know history, but nothing is exactly quite the same. But what I do think is an issue that we have watched, it was certainly true um, in the 20th century, having begun in earlier centuries, is the role of nationalism. Mm -hmm. Nationalism is a very kind of two-edged sword in that people need to have pride in their nation, mm -hmm. uh, patriotism. But when that becomes something virulent, which in turn is hatred of the people who mm -hmm. live next door and is used for the purpose of domestic politics to divert attention from some economic problems or whatever, then it's very dangerous. And what I find troubling is that's what destroyed large portions of Europe mm. um, during um, the first part of the 20th century. And to some extent, because there have been a variety of economic problems in, in Europe, there are questions about how well the European Union functions. And in fact, there's some return of nationalism generally. Uh, you can see what just happened in the elections in Hungary, mm -hmm. where fr really passing strange. Viktor Orban I met in the 80s, and he was this young student and very idealistic, and all of a sudden he's turned into a hyper-nationalist who thinks that Hungary should be larger. Um, and so it is a dangerous aspect. You introduced me with my very long story, and, and I am very sensitive to this as somebody who was born in Czechoslovakia. Uh, Czechoslovakia was, is a multi-ethnic country, uh, and one of the issues really was what happened to a very large German minority, which once Czechoslovakia has, had been formed in 1918, many Germans lived in the northwestern part of Czechoslovakia, known as Sudetenland because it's south of Germany, and there were some uh, people who lived there who felt that they had not gotten the jobs they wanted, but for the most part, as I look at history, it was fairly well, carefully done. Uh, and they did have jobs, and there was a way to make everybody live together. There was a person there who provoked problems. His name was Conrad Henlein. He was a Nazi. Uh, and so the issue came, what was gonna happen to this part of the country? And one of the parts, that this is why I, I try to be careful about this, is that people were concerned about what was going to happen, and uh, the issue was Munich. And what happened was that the Germans and the Italians made a deal with the British and French over the heads of the Czechoslovaks. They never were at the table. Uh, and their, um, the country was sold down the river. And so I think one has to be careful not to exclude, I mean, in this case, the Ukrainians have to be at the table. You cannot have somebody who uses provocation in order to separate one part of a country from another. We don't have to go into all the motivations of it, but these kinds of things have happened, and they are very dangerous, and uh, you never know when they're going to stop. And as we think forward about um, what we can do to redress the problem or uh, ameliorate it. There is no military option, as we all know. Uh, whether it's Bangladesh or not, it has a lot of uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, no one wants to see bloodshed on the European continent. Unilateral sanctions by the United States aren't going to make any difference. In fact, they'll probably make us look weak, if anything. And I guess the question I have for you is, do you see the West coming together around this issue and taking the kind of action uh, that is necessary. I think this is really a moment when uh, Europe needs to be heard from. I, I thought last week uh, that in fact Putin, who had tried to divide Europe, had actually united it. And what I thought was very interesting, President Obama had been scheduled to go to Europe. Um, these were previously scheduled meetings that were taking place in Brussels and The Hague. And in fact, the, he brought a lot of leaders together. I think there was a very strong statement in terms of support. Um, and um, the hope is that it will last. Though in terms of reading the paper this morning, there are already some questions about where the Germans are on this. This is the problem, if I could state it this way. 
Economic sanction, well, first of all, at Georgetown I teach a course. Um, I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want, is all it is. So the bottom line is what are the tools? And so there are not a lot of tools in that national security toolbox. There is diplomacy, bilateral, multilateral, on one end, and the use of force on the other, the threat of the use of force. And as you know, when we were in the government, people would say, don't threaten the use of force unless you're prepared to use it. Right. Uh, law enforcement and intelligence, and in the middle are, are the economic tools, the carrots, which are trade and aid, and sanctions, which are the sticks. Sanctions, so you, we always like to choose the middle option, and so in many ways, sanctions are the tool of choice in many, because you diplomacy you do all the time, and the use of force brings its own problems. The question is always between unilateral and multilateral sanctions. The problem with sanctions is they take quite a long time to take effect. Uh, it is a matter of cutting off a variety of people from their capabilities of carrying on economic life. And what is interesting is often the countries, the targeting countries, uh, also uh, absorb the problems of sanctions as well as the targeted countries. Mm -hmm. And so there is some pain to it. Uh, there is the evident problem in Europe which is even more dependent in terms of trade and issues with the Russians, as to whether they're gonna suck it up and deal with it. And that is the question. We are operating with democracies uh, that obviously have to have the support of their people, and the sanctions take a while to take hold. I do think that the point has to be made over and over again that this is a game changer, that many things could change in Europe if in fact there is not a a unified approach to it. What is making people nervous right now, Crimea we can talk about because it is a, a very uh, historically uh, peculiar place in that way, but the bottom line is there are Russian speaking populations in the Baltics, in Latvia more than the others. Um, there are, there's the issue of Moldova where there already is this kind of peculiar place called Transnistria. And, there, and the question is, to go back to your issue, is do you protect some kind of an ethnic group? These are multi-ethnic societies. And there's always some group that is ready to be paid to be provocative. And so that's the danger, is that um, this will spread. And if we don't stand up in some way, in a unified way, then the issue of Europe whole and free is a real question. And I believe that the United States is much stronger when it has a unified Europe uh, working together so we can deal with the problems in some other parts of the world. <clears throat> One of the first things that you learn in diplomacy, of course, is that everything is connected, much to one's frustration. And when we look at some of the other key issues that we're dealing with around the world, they depend on Russian cooperation. Uh, how do we go forward now in terms of dealing with Iran and its nuclear program. We weren't getting a lot of cooperation of the Russians on Syria, but there too, the structure of the international community is such that it's very hard to make any progress uh, without Russia. How, how do we get ourselves out of this Gordian knot? Well, I think the, one has to make the assumptions that the Russian foreign policy is not altruistic as far as either Iran or Syria is concerned that they have national interests that they want to deal with. And so I, I think that you're absolutely right, everything is connected, but we just shouldn't say that it is. <laughs> um, and that basically uh, there's a P5 plus one meetings going on in Vienna now on Iran. Um, and the question is how the Russians are going to behave in there. But theoretically, they also don't want to see a nuclear armed Iran. On Syria, uh, they, Again, this was not done out of uh, altruism. They are concerned, were concerned, about the spread of chemical weapons um, into various parts of Russia, frankly, um, in terms of extremist groups, etc. They wanted to get some control over the chemical weapons. They haven't exactly shown that they are helpful uh, when we talk about humanitarian assistance in Syria. So I think we just have to assume that there are certain areas where the Russians will see their realistic um, approach that they need to work with us. But um, it all, a lot depends on the mood, a lot depends on um, whether they actually look at it that way. But we are involved, part of the deal was here that we thought that we were gonna make Russia a part of the international system where they would actually be helpful on certain issues. 
We need them on uh, some issues to do with climate change or ships in the Arctic or um, some in tracking um, terrorists in a variety mm -hmm. of ways. So I think that the effort should be, um, and this is the hard part, is how you begin to isolate them on one part and then try to figure out how to really involve them in some of the other issues. And it is difficult, there's no question. I mean, we don't want to completely never speak to the Russians again. Um, and so how we kind of divide this is, is part of the difficulty of this. I think one of the questions that's being asked now is whether we should look back and, and, and examine what we did uh, in the 90s. When we went to the Madrid summit, you were at the front of the bus, I was in the back. Um, for NATO enlargement. And I guess the question is, uh, uh, do you think that that bears re-examination, or did we do the right thing then and, and we need to march forward? I think we did the right thing. It was not done just kind of off the top of our heads. I think the thing that has to be remembered, um, and I, this has been very much a part of uh, the life that I've been involved in, is uh, the United States, by the way, at the end of World War II offered the Soviet Union, the Marshall Plan. Um, and what was interesting, uh, Czechoslovakia accepted. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that um, the foreign minister of Czechoslovakia, Jan Masaryk, was summoned to Moscow and told flat out that they couldn't accept the Marshall Plan. Um, and my father was actually chief of staff to the foreign minister at the time, and he reported on the fact that Masaryk came back from Moscow and said, I now know that I am not the foreign minister of a sovereign country. What happened after World War II, um, as a result of agreements made during World War II, the Soviet, the Red Army, quote, liberated Central and Eastern Europe. And as a result of a variety of salami tactics, one after another became a communist country. Czechoslovakia was the last one. There was a coup in 1948, long, a complicated story. Uh, and as a result of that, NATO was formed in 49. All of a sudden, the United States saw what was going on in terms of uh, this salami tactics of creating um, the Soviet bloc. Uh, and so NATO was formed, and these people that had wanted to be part of the West at the end of World War II were excluded from it. And instead, they were made to be members of the Warsaw Pact. The Warsaw Pact falls apart. We didn't destroy the Warsaw Pact. Nobody wanted to be members of it. So the question was, how do you, and when I was talking about the survey that I did, we went all over and people in Poland and uh, Hungary and Czechoslovakia would say, we just want to be Europeans. And so the question was, being a part of NATO was part of being Europeans, uh, and I think it was the right thing to do. It, I went around with, um, we talked first about the Partnership for Peace and trying to figure out how to bring these countries in. It's, uh, uh, NATO is not a uh, charitable organization. It is, you have to in fact fulfill certain commitments uh, and these countries were prepared to do it. So I think it was the right thing to do. One of the things I was asked to do um, in, uh, it was just been the 60th anniversary of NATO, the heads of state met in Strasbourg, Kiel, and a new secretary general was named. And then the heads of states also decided that there needed to be a new strategic concept for NATO and that there should be a group of experts that would work on it. Every country named an expert and the United States named me. Then uh, Secretary General Rasmussen decided that the group of experts would have 12 countries represented, automatically irritating 16 countries, and then he asked me to chair it. So we looked at what the new strategic concept for NATO was supposed to be. This organization that had been created during the Cold War, most powerful military alliance in the history of the world, what was its mandate? So we began to look more and more at out of area aspects, such as what had been, some had been in Bosnia, but then also in Afghanistan, what were the different things that NATO was gonna do? It was not anti-Russian. And for his own historical purposes, I think that Putin, he needs an enemy. And so I think we should not allow that to undermine mm -hmm. the existence of NATO. So I think it's, it was the right thing to do. Let's talk for a moment about other challenges that seem to never go away. We're now in a pause to reassess the uh, Middle East uh, peace process talks. 
this has been uh, quite a soap opera, if you will, and we've gone, uh, it seems, over the brink, although you never really know in the Middle East whether you're over the brink or on the edge. We're coming back from the brink. You had long experience um, wrestling with some of the uh, personalities uh, involved in these talks, and I'm curious what you think about the prospects now. The, the word on the street in international relations, if you will, is that the, the two-state solution may be at an end, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, I uh, am an optimist who worries a lot. <laughs> um, and so let me just say this. I think that this is a constantly iterative story, and, and even though there are an awful lot of people here, if I were to invite you to come to Camp David, you might think it would be fun. I can tell you after two weeks in the rain with the Israelis and Palestinians, I don't care if I ever go back. Um, and uh, it has been very much a back and forth, some of it drama and some of it just the difficulty of working out the issues. I think we know what the answers are. Uh, when President Clinton left office, he laid down the Clinton parameters. There, there are only a limited number of solutions here, and the two-state solution has been a part of it. Uh, and so I hate to think it's the end of the two-state solution. I know that there are real questions as to whether there should be one state. Um, I think if one believes that Israel is a Jewish state, which I do, um, then there's the question about what happens to the variety of Palestinians and Arabs that live in Israel. Israel is a democracy, and therefore having people vote and be a part of it is, mm -hmm. is the is the issue, frankly. So uh, in terms of demography, what does that do? And so I think the two-state solution is the only solution. And the question is, since we know what the answers are, and the United States has done, I think, I think Secretary Kerry has been remarkable in his um, dedication and doggedness to this, but ultimately, it's the leaders in the countries themselves that have to make the decisions. And, um, and that is, the question is exactly whether um, they look at the precipice and think, uh, I, I'll never fall in, the other guy will, mm -hmm. um, or, or whether they actually see that their futures are linked and that they have to go back to the table. But this is a pretty dicey time. Um, and so, um, but, but I have been an optimist, uh, unnecessarily so, or unrequitedly so for a long time. But I, but I do think that is the only solution. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, something uh, uh, Václav Havel said to you once after you gave a speech in, uh, in Prague, where he said, no, that, that's a speech no, no, no Czech uh, diplomat or statesman could have ever given because it was too optimistic. Right. Right. But you gave it in check. I, the, <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, you know, everybody has their history, and and I, why would I wouldn't be an optimist? I mean, I grew up in Czechoslovakia. I came to the United States. I got to be an American citizen, and I ended up as Secretary of State. Not so bad. Not so bad. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That actually. Uh, that reminds me of uh, the story that uh, the president told when uh, you were given the uh, Medal of Freedom, um, where an Ethiopian man, you were at a naturalization ceremony, and an Ethiopian man came up to you and said, only in America uh, can a refugee meet the Secretary of State. And you responded? Only in America can a refugee become Secretary of State. Yeah. <laughs> so, one of the things I love to do, I have to say, is go to naturalization ceremonies. On, um, the most amazing one, frankly, and you were talking about Thomas Jefferson, was the one uh, during the millennium mm -hmm. in Monticello. And um, it was an incredible ceremony for people that have been in Monticello. It's beautiful. Um, and it obviously was outside. And I am not an officer of the law, so I could not administer mm -hmm. the oath of office. But then I went around and I gave everybody their naturalization certificate. And I said to them, I have exactly the same certificate. Is the most important piece of paper you will ever get. Keep it safely. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you've been very busy. And you've been very, very busy for a long time. And it's quite, kind I of I am uh, really old. I mean, I, I uh, That wasn't wait, what no, I meant. No. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I went to college at a time somewhere between the invention of the iPad and the discovery of fire. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think you were a little closer to the iPad. Um, 
But I wanted to ask you about, um, first of all, what the secret of your energy is, um, and second of all, how you've managed to keep all the balls in the air. Uh, I was mentioning to Secretary Albright before that probably the last time we had half as many people in one, uh, in one auditorium here at Dartmouth was when Anne Marie Slaughter was here last year, not talking about Syria or foreign policy, but about work-life balance. And in the interim, we've had Sheryl Sandberg's book, uh, Lean In, and this has been a, a big debate. And you were dealing with these questions long before any of us knew you could get a really big book contract out of it. <clears throat> and I'm curious to know how, you have, how, how you've balanced all these things and how you feel about this debate. Well, let me say um, that um, I, I did go to a women's college, and, and I think that I loved Wellesley, and I graduated I, I waited a really, most people thought about getting married. I, I waited a really long time, three days after graduation to get married. And you told part of the story, but part of it was it didn't occur to me that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. So I had this job that you describe at the Rolla Daily News. And then my husband was a reporter, and we moved back to Chicago, and we were having dinner with his managing editor. So he looks at me and he says, So what are you going to do, honey? And I said, I'm going to work on a newspaper. And he said, I don't think so. You can't work on the same paper as your husband because of labor guild regulations. And even though there were three other papers in Chicago at the time, uh, he said, and you wouldn't want to compete with your husband. Now, I know exactly what I would say now or what some of the people in the audience might say. <laughs> but at the time, I just saluted and found another life. I did do the Encyclopedia Britannica, which for the younger people in the audience is a book. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and so among the things I did was not only select the pictures, but there was a time that newspaper columns needed to be justified at the bottom, and so they needed some factoid. So I read the Encyclopedia Britannica, so I knew things like ostriches are voiceless, according to the Encyclopedia. <laughs> so then we moved um, again, because that's what one does uh, when you're married, and we moved to Long Island. And um, all of a sudden, I was very fat, they didn't have sonograms, and they kept saying, you're so fat, and then it turned out I was having twins. So, um, but I had to leave my twins in incubators in the hospital. So I had always wanted to learn Russian. And because I was Czech, I knew that first year Russian would be too easy, but I didn't know second year Russian. So as I left the, the children in the incubators, I started taking Russian. And I did that, and that really led me to graduate school. But Part of the thing was, and this is hard to say, is that every woman's middle name is guilt. Uh, and you're never quite in the right place. And especially in that era, because I was going to graduate school and doing my period of good works, the people that made me feel the worst were other women who said, don't you think you should be in the carpool line or whatever? And so this balance was something that was hard to deal with. You know, I think every woman in this room asks herself whether she's a good mother or not. Um, I finally did go get this job, uh, and my youngest daughter at the time was eight or nine, and I said, Katie, do you care? And she said, but mom, at least I'll know where you are. <laughs> so uh, I was working for Senator Muskie, and I had always agreed that I would always take a phone call from my children, no matter what. But one time, I was on the Senate floor with the Senator Muskie, and so, Katie called, and they said, your mother can't talk to you. She's on the floor with Senator Muskie. So when I came home, Katie said, what are you doing on the floor with Senator? <laughs> uh, 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 but uh, the question was how to make that balance work, and it never was particularly easy. But I have talked to my three daughters, who now are all married and have children, and the issues are always the same. Mm -hmm. And they really are that you do feel that you it's not easy, and there's no one formula. And I think that um, Anne-Marie has talked about the necessity of having um, the workplace a little bit more adjusted. Cheryl talks in a different way, and it's a perfect example of that there is no one answer. And so what I believe is obviously men are an important part in making this work, but so are other women. And the single most famous thing I ever said was that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other, and part of it has to do with not making each other feel guilty. Uh, 
Well, of course, since you were Secretary of State, it seems as though women have pretty much had a lock on that mm -hmm. position. Uh, and, uh, you know, Secretary Kerry is trying to claw that turf back. But um, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious what your evaluation is of the progress of uh, women in uh, both the foreign policy field but in Washington more broadly. It's improved, but it's not completely there, I don't think. I think that, by the way, my youngest granddaughter said uh, four years ago when she was seven, she said, so what's the big deal about Grandma Maddie being Secretary of State? Only girls are Secretary of State. So <laughs> that is very different than when my name came up and people were saying, can a woman possibly be Secretary of State? I think that there are more uh, women in Congress um, and I think I'm often asked whether there's a way there could be more women in Congress, as there are in parliaments in the Scandinavian countries. I think Americans don't like the idea of quotas or something like that, but I do think that there need to be more women uh, in Congress. I happen to believe I, I vote on the issues. I would prefer to have a man who believes in choice than Sarah Palin. So it mm -hmm. is not a matter of... Uh, so, uh, uh, but I do think that one of the things that we know is that in fact, it requires, it's more things happen if you have a support group within a system. So if there are more women um, in the State Department of the National Security Council, or if in other countries there are more women in ministerial posts, um, and more women are politically and economically empowered, that it does make a difference. Um, and, and I think there should be more. I, I happen to think that men and women working together on these issues uh, is very important. I know one of the issues, one of the students asked me this earlier, um, would the world be, you know, do women think differently? I do think in some ways in terms of um, the more kind of empathy in a number of ways, putting yourself into the other person's shoes. Uh, I'm often asked, would the world be better if it were completely run by women? I say, no, if you think that, you've forgotten high school. So the bottom line is that you need uh, the men and women working together. You know, you mentioned uh, empathy, and I'm reminded, having leafed through your, um, your autobiography uh, again, um, that you um, achieved a, a rare kind of fame. You're uh, famous in the way that you actually get mentioned in New Yorker cartoons, which doesn't happen to very many of us. Yeah. And one of my absolute favorites is of the woman trying on the dress uh, in the shop, and the very happy uh, shop assistant looks at beams at that woman and says, Madeline Albright just kicked butt in that dress. Yeah, that. <laughs> uh, well, so much for empathy. OK. Um, <laughs> um, one of the reasons that I actually leg press, 450 pounds, is so that I can. Uh, <laughs> we'll keep that in mind over dinner. Um, so, um, you know, one of the other things that I have to say uh, really impressed me about your autobiography was um, how you humanized, in many ways, the position of uh, a Secretary of State. I mean, your predecessor was a, a great man, Warren Christopher, but warm and fuzzy was not his long suit. And I um, have to say that in reading your book, you get such a strong feeling of what it's like to be a person uh, in, in these situations. It's, of course, a, a, an autobiography, not just a memoir of your uh, time at, uh, at the department. Um, and I came across this one uh, footnote of yours, which I think kind of sums it all up. You said uh, that you found a, a note, a reminder. You were um, talking about how presidents can compartmentalize, and you said, you came across notes of my reminders, uh, note of my reminders to myself dated January 28th, 1998. Call Senator Helms, call King Hussein, call Foreign Minister Amr Musa, make other congressional calls, prepare for China meeting, buy no, non-fat yogurt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were juggling a lot of things. Yeah, no, well, I'll tell you what was interesting. When, <laughs> when I was ambassador at the UN, uh, it was, you know, I had lived on Long Island. I always thought that I would like to live in Manhattan under the right circumstances. <laughs> so the apartment is the penthouse of the Waldorf. Um, and um, you actually, it's a hotel. And one of the things that we were trying to do at the time, you know, that there is no residence. And um, Congress wanted to know why we were paying so much rent at the 
hotel and we'd say, well, it is a hotel and you get all <clears> the <throat> soaps and they come make your bed and all that. <clears throat> and, and I had a chef and a driver. So then I'd go back to my house in Washington uh, where I'd lived since 1968. I did have security, they all moved into my garage, but I didn't have, you know, I, I needed to buy yogurt. Uh, and so I had to deal with those particular issues. And I did have a family. I mean, my kids were grown up. <clears throat> One of the parts that was kind of fun, actually, my Dartmouth daughter took over my, my life. And she would pay bills and things. And we completely reversed positions. She'd call me up and she'd say, I just have your credit card here. And do you actually, did you need those other pair of shoes? Uh, <clears throat> And then, as we all worry, one of the things when I was in Croatia and um, I was, uh, went into this market in uh, Bukovar and I got, they stoned us. They started throwing stones at me. And one of the problems of actually understanding Serbian, I could hear what they were saying and they were saying kurva, kurva, which means whore. And I said to the security people, we need to get out of here. <clears throat> so CNN curry, covered a story, carried a story that said, Albright stoned in Bukovar. So um, <coughs> my uh, daughter calls me and she said, called the operations center at the State Department and said, have you heard from my mother? And they said, no. And I got home and, they, and she said, what are you doing going to dangerous places? You can't go to places without telling us what you're doing. So there was that reversal. And I've got to say that my kids and my grandkids are the ones that kept me as a completely human being uh -huh. through all of it. Great. Um, <clears throat> we should uh, probably come back to uh, a slightly more somber um, issue, and that is that, as you know, today we are one day after the 20th anniversary of uh, the beginning of the genocide in Rwanda. And um, this is something that you have spoken about a great deal. Uh, and I believe everyone who was in that first term of the Clinton administration feels uh, you know, burdened and, and, and troubled by what happened uh, then and there. But I am curious to know if uh, at this particular milestone you have any more thoughts about it. And as we face a particularly um, impossible challenge in Syria where the killing goes on, uh, what we might be considering to improve our reaction to these kinds of um, humanitarian crises. It is clearly something that has been on all our minds, and it's certainly something President Clinton has over and over again asked for. How did this happen? Why did it happen? Uh, <clears throat> and trying to figure out what went wrong. I talk about it fairly frequently, and one of the things, because I do teach this kind of decision-making course, is and, and you know this from your own experience, which is that in it's very, hindsight is terrific. Uh, there's a lot of information that comes out afterwards, but at the time you have to make decisions on the basis of the information that you have. And people may not believe this, I just tell you it's a statement of fact because I went back over intelligence and things. We didn't know everything that we now know about what happened in Rwanda. Uh, and in, in fact, um, they're really, uh, the information, it, it was what I call volcanic genocide because the airplane of the Hutu president was shot down and all of a sudden this happened very quickly. Um, I spent a lot of time arguing about my instructions and I won't go through all that. But what we're watching now is rolling genocide in a number of different places. And I have spent a lot of time looking at all of this. We all have our stories and I am a child of World War II. One could make the argument that people didn't know what was happening during World War II. In the Balkans, we began to get information on what was happening, and there are a lot of reasons that I thought we needed to do something in the Balkans, but it was because we saw on CNN that people were being raped uh, and murdered for being an ethnic, what, whatever ethnic group they were. I have tried to keep with this issue for a very long time, and did a, um, a, a task force under the um, auspices of the U.S. Institute for Peace and the Holocaust Museum on genocide prevention, trying to figure out how you get the information ahead of time. 
and very rarely does a task force produce any results. But what happened was we suggested that there be an atrocities prevention board uh, within the NSC system. And because Samantha Power was there, as an individual, it does exist. President Obama made it happen. So then there was the next piece to it. And I was asked to co-chair a task force on what is now known as the responsibility to protect, which makes life very different. If you know that something is happening, does the international community have some responsibility to do something about it? And it's a General Assembly resolution that has been out there. And so the Libya um, mandate was done with the responsibility to protect in it. And the question is then, who carries it out? And what happens if it goes slightly, there's a real question as to whether Libya hurt or helped the, the responsibility to protect. There's the judgment that it hurt, because to some extent it went beyond protecting the civilians mm -hmm. to regime change. So the question is now Syria. There is no question that people are being barrel bombed and starvation is being used as a weapon of war. Uh, I happen to think that there is this responsibility to protect, but the question is who carries it out and what are the issues if in fact there is no no-fly zone or how do you provide the humanitarian assistance. But I think we're slowly learning, but I, what I think, and I um, was asked this question yesterday in Washington, um, I don't want, I know what I feel like that we didn't do Rwanda. I know what it's like. I get asked it, President Clinton gets asked it. We are going to be asked, why didn't we do something about Syria? Not 20 years from now, but a year from now. And I do think that that responsibility to protect exists. And one of the things, to go back to the historical analogy, um, I finally, as a result of writing Prague Winter, understood some of the decision-making process around Munich. And something that I never quite understood was how tired the British and French were from World War I. They had lost a whole generation of young men, their budget was a mess, and their military was decapitated in many ways. And while I will always believe that Neville Chamberlain is one of the more odious characters in history, I do understand all of a sudden why he wanted peace so much. And what he said about the country that I was born in why should we care about people in faraway places with unpronounceable names? So the question is, we are tired from Afghanistan and Iraq. Our budget is a mess. There are questions about our military. And so we have to ask ourselves, do we care about people in faraway places with unpronounceable names? And will we be sorry if we don't actually do something about it? You mentioned Congress before. <clears throat> and for... Uh... For a moment, I was thinking that the first uh, question that I would ask you today um, was, um, is it really like in House of Cards? Is it really that bad? <laughs> um, <clears throat> but this is a, a broader question about polarization. Uh, you managed to uh, have a good working relationship uh, with a man whose nickname was Senator No, Jesse Helms, who was really one of the legendary figures in the history of the Senate, uh, and a man who uh, was very, very challenging to work with uh, by all accounts. It doesn't seem like there's even that kind of relationship across the aisle anywhere today. And uh, as someone who has watched Washington through administrations, Republican and Democrat, uh, I'm wondering what your reflections are and what we need to do to get out of this, uh, this mess. Well, I think it is, it is not as bad as House of Cards, but I think it is <laughs> essential uh, to have that relationship. And I learned that from Ed Muskie. Mm -hmm. Ed Muskie um, became the first chairman of the Budget Committee, and the question was how to make it work. And he told of all of us that worked for him, you have to work with Senator Henry Bellman, who was the ranking member Republican from Oklahoma. And there were a lot of relationships that went across the aisle. We worked with Senator Dole, a number of different people. My Helms relationship solidified that in my head. And I'll tell you how it happened, was I had just been made ambassador to the United Nations. And I get this phone call from Senator Helms himself saying, there was a women's college in Raleigh. And he said, you have been invited to come and speak at the bicentennial anniversary at this women's college, and would you do it? And I thought I could get out of it by saying, sure, I'll do it, but, would, but if you come with me, 
So <laughs> I get this call back a half an hour later, said, I've changed my schedule, I'm going there with you. <laughs> so we go there, and when somebody has invited you to speak and they introduce you, they usually, you were really nice, but you know, they usually <laughs> say nice things. They're not gonna say this idiot woman has just shown up here. <laughs> so uh, he introduces me. I was talking to students. They were asking me questions about the UN. Here's this man who hated the UN. Uh, and I was answering them, and we flew back together, and he actually kept talking about it. He was very interesting, interested in it and all of that. Then what happens is he calls me up, and he said, I want you to come to my alma mater, Wingate. So uh, I go, we go by car uh, from Raleigh to this place, and we are looking for barbecue places, and we're in this car forever. And we finally get there, and he was basically bionic in terms of having artificial hips. He couldn't move and had to get out of the car. So I'm helping him out, and I'm hanging on to him. And there are pictures, and they all of a sudden start saying, the odd couple. I, I mean, we're, I'm, I'm trying to... So I managed to talk about the Chemical Weapons Convention and uh, the convention about the equality, CEDAW about women. He's sitting in the audience. I mean, sitting with me on the stage, and we keep talking about more and more things. So then I'm named Secretary of State, and I go to talk to him about confirmation, uh, and he said, Ms. Madeline, we will make history together. And if you look at the, my hearings with him, they're all on tape. He's winking at me and uh, being very, very friendly. We were talking about NATO expansion. It wouldn't have happened mm -hmm. without him. And so I do think, despite the fact that we disagreed on very basic aspects of America, ultimately we were able to work together. And I think it makes a difference. And I am very troubled by what is going on now. I love the American system. You were talking about executive, le I did a lot of the, I worked with Congress when I was uh, uh, on the National Security Council. I am chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, which talks about the nuts and bolts of democracy. We're all over the place. So we were somewhere, and I'd say, the essence of democracy is the existence of an opposition party, because in fact, it allows a choice to the voters and accountability to the government. And it's important to compromise. So then they say to us, whatever country, yeah, like you guys now. So we are a very bad model for our own system. And so I do think it's essential and, and I think we all need to work on it. I actually have a lot of Republican friends, um, and they, the kind that I have, kind of feel out of it in terms of some of the things that are happening, and there's the center that needs to be worked on. And part of the problem that has happened in terms of some of the international issues, the far left and the far right have met on the other side in terms of not getting involved in anything internationally. Mm. And I think that is dangerous, obviously, the way that we've been discussing issues. So I would like to see more Democrats in the center work with Republicans in the center to try to regain some civility and actually get something done. And I, and I uh, also have to say, that I find passing strange that people would want to be elected to Congress because they don't like government and don't want to be there. Why do they want to get elected? I'm not sure anyone here can answer that one, but I'm, <clears throat> I just want to ask one last question and then we'll turn it over to the audience, um, which I'm sure will have many more uh, interesting questions than I have. But you, um, diplomacy is about sending signals and um, you innovated a new kind of signaling um, that uh, had to do with jewelry. Um, and uh, uh, I know that uh, you've written a whole book about signaling through jewelry. Um, my guess is that there are courses uh, at NYU and elsewhere that would love to have you come talk about um, fashion and diplomacy. But tell us about the, the, the brooch you're wearing and, and perhaps about some of the other uh, uh, pins that you have used uh, to send messages. Well, i tell you how it got started. When I got to the UN, it was in February 93, and the Gulf War had just ended, and the ceasefire had been translated into a series of sanctions resolutions. And I was an instructed ambassador, which meant that we had to keep the sanctions on, 
And my instructions were to say perfectly terrible things about Saddam Hussein constantly, which he deserved. He'd invaded Kuwait. So we went at this a long time. Finally, there was a poem that appeared in the papers in Baghdad comparing me to many things, but among them an unparalleled serpent. And I had a snake pin, so I decided to wear it when we were talking about Iraq. And so you've seen when the ambassadors come out and talk to the press um, after the meetings, and all of a sudden the camera zeroes in and says, why are you wearing that snake pin? I said, because Saddam Hussein compared me to an unparalleled serpent. And then I thought, well, this is fun. So I went out. <laughs> uh, and I bought a lot of costume jewelry uh -huh. uh, according to what I thought we were going to do on any given day. So on good days, I wore flowers and butterflies and balloons, and on bad days, insects and a variety of <laughs> So the other ambassadors would say, well, what are we going to do today? And as you remember, first President Bush had said, read my lips, no new taxes. Mm -hmm. So I said, read my pins. And that is how it started. <laughs> so then um, there are lots of stories that I have with them. but. There are times that the pins, um, well, this pin, let me tell you about, was given to me by General Shali Kashvili, my great friend. He'd be chairman of the Joint Chiefs. It's actually called America, and the pearls signify the aspects of America, justice, freedom, prosperity, mm -hmm. liberty. So I thought it was a good thing to wear. Pins have gotten me into trouble, and they've gotten me out of trouble. So. What happened, There's you've seen this picture when we were doing the 50th anniversary of NATO. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that President Clinton and Secretary of Defense Bill Cohen and I were sitting on a sofa, three of us, and I don't know who started it, but we did the hear no evil, see no, speak no evil monkeys. And it was in Time Magazine, we looked like crazy people. And uh, <laughs> so I decided that I was somewhere and they had three monkey pins, so I bought them. So we went to Russia for our um, uh, summit in the summer of 2000, and I wore the monkey pins. So we're walking in, and President Putin turns to President Clinton and says, we always notice what pins Secretary Albright wears. Why are you wearing those monkeys? And I actually said the following thing, which is because I think your Chechnya policy is evil. President Clinton looks at me like, have you lost your mind? Uh, you are the chief diplomat. You have just screwed up the summit. Putin was furious. Anyway, so that was that. So that's when they got me into trouble. And then there was a time they got me out of trouble. This is a little risque. So uh, what happened was I actually invented the art of diplomatic kissing. You can't visualize Baker or Kissinger going in having no. a big embrace. Anyway. So, and it's much more complicated than meets the eye. The Latin, some kiss on the right cheek, some on the left cheek, so a lot of bump noses. Then the French kiss twice, the Dutch kiss three times. Then there was Yasser Arafat, just, you just thought, keep right? Just kissing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, I arrive in South Korea one time, big embrace, we have a great meeting, and all of a sudden I get a phone call when it's over, I'm back home, from um, a journalist who says, don't you think that the Korean foreign minister should be fired about what he said about you. And I said, well, what did he say? And he said, well, I really like it when Secretary Albright comes here. We're about the same age, but I'm this tired old man. And when I embrace her, she has very firm breasts. So what do you have to say about that? And I said, well, I have to have something to put those pins on. <laughs> Okay, well, you took the wind out of my sails. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I can only say that uh, having mastered uh, diplomacy, policy, politics, uh, stand-up is uh, <laughs> the obvious next step. And with that, um, how about uh, we have some questions from the audience? Please, uh, I just want to ensure that, um, please state your name. Uh, that's one rule. The other rule is please have a question mark at the end of the question. Um, no, no perorations, no uh, declamations. That would be great. Thank you. Why don't we, can we start over here? Thank you very much. Uh, what, would, what actions would you actually like to see the U.S. take in Syria, in regards to Syria, and do you think that those are actually feasibly going to happen ever? Um, well, I, I would like to see some kind of additional humanitarian assistance. The United States has done quite a lot, I have to say. Um, and the question is, how to work out a way to get more assistance in there um, in terms of um, some kind of 
and, and I'm not sure this can happen in terms of some kind of military protection, not necessarily by the United States, but in a way that food really could be delivered and also uh, medicines. One of the things that we're seeing, for instance, we have thought polio has been eradicated. Uh, it has come back in a variety of places. Syria is one of them and it has spread to a number of other places. So I think that we need to somehow get in there. I know there are discussions about a no-fly zone. I think that's very difficult. And then I think that some of the diplomatic activities in terms of trying to get a transition government is essential. And, but I do think that we need to get some uh, additional assistance in there, trying to figure out a protected way to get it in, but not just by the United States. Hi, so shortly after you were Secretary of State, the, the terrorist attacks happened, and I was just wondering how much Afghanistan was on the radar when you were Secretary of State and what you tried to do with Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations in that region. Yes. Um, <clears throat> first of all, um, <coughs> excuse me, Al-Qaeda was very much um, on the scene and something, uh, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, one of the things that had happened very early on uh, in 93, when there was an initial uh, terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, or an attempt on the World Trade Center, also threats at the United Nations. This is something that we actually worked on together mm -hmm. in terms of trying to figure out how to, what happened, who had done it. We did know um, that uh, various elements of Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden were behind a lot of the aspects, that he had spent some time in Sudan, uh, and then there were the embassy attacks, which is a whole other issue in terms of how we responded to that. The other part, though, on Afghanistan that was going on was, I think, in many ways, Afghanistan, um, everything that happened uh, after the Soviet invasion and the Soviets were pushed out, was lack of attention by the United States. We just left. Uh, and the Taliban, in many ways, was created some by the Pakistanis in terms of creating law and order. And what we were trying to do when we were in office was trying to figure out how to, whom, how to support and whom to support in Afghanistan. It was very much um, on, on our radar. I went a number of times to refugee camps. One of the issues was we didn't want to recognize the Taliban uh, because of their treatment of women. Uh, and so there was kind of never, never land. Uh, we were trying to get then, when Osama bin Laden went to Afghanistan, to get the Pakistanis to help us get him out. That wasn't happening. Um, and so it was very much on our radar screen, but not, uh, I think, and by the way, one of the things that was going on, we spent an awful lot of time dealing with issues to do with terrorism. Um, President Clinton, I won't go through, well, you were involved in all of this in terms of creating counterterrorism centers, a number of different ways. There was a whole part uh, that was tracking Osama bin Laden. Uh, we were working on it in all kinds of ways. When we were, one of the interesting periods in American history is, or politics, is the transition period. Both Sandy Berger and I briefed our successors about the threat of terrorism. There was no principles meeting to discuss terrorism until after 9-11. And there was a real question as to how seriously it was taken. But believe me, we spent a lot of time on Afghanistan and on terrorism. Okay, over here. Thank you again for coming. And my question is more about Eastern Europe. Uh, and so I study abroad in Prague last year, and I talked to a lot of people about how they were nervous about a resurgent Russia. And I'm sure those feelings have only grown stronger since then. Uh, and with most of these countries in Eastern Europe now part of NATO, the Baltic countries, the Czech Republic, and so on, uh, if Russia were to move into, you know, to look to protect the Russian minorities in Estonia or in the Baltic states, would one of those states uh, evoke clause or section five of NATO? What are the prospects of that? Or how do you see Eastern European countries reacting to Russia in their backyards? Well, Article five is central to the NATO treaty. And what it says is an attack on one is an attack on all. And one of the issues that we were dealing with when we were looking over the strategic, new strategic concept at all was how relevant Article 5 continued to be. Everybody signed up for it. What was an interesting question at that time uh, was whether a cyber attack was an Article 5 attack. And the question was, could, were you able to trace it or not? So the, the question of Article 5 is out there. 
Article 5 has only been invoked once in the entire history, which was after 9-11. Um, and um, the question is, um, I don't know the, if, they, if it were to be invoked, then in fact there is a responsibility to do something about it. And the question is, to what extent, um, what one would do, who would carry it out. It's the threat of Article 5 that I think is actually very important. I mean, it has worked in a number of different ways in terms of deterrence. The problem is, if one takes what is happening now, is there's not going to be some kind of a military, uh, I mean, part of the way this has been happening is through provocations and things. So it's hard to speak about what might happen, but Article 5 is a real thing. One of the things that is happening is NATO has um, set up a number of um, exercises that are going on. There are airplanes that are doing surveillance. And, and NATO, uh, Secretary General Rasmussen has really been fairly active on all this. And then when President Obama uh, was in, in Brussels, this was a part of the discussion. We have a, a, an obligation. Uh, but the, the question is how um, the various parts of it would evolve. I think it has been an important deterrent, frankly. Okay. Over here, please. Okay. Um, one argument I've heard against the two-state solution is that it would make it, it'd make it much more difficult for Israel to defend itself against future um, Palestinian aggression. Given that you're a supporter of the two-state solution, how would you respond to that? I, I don't agree with that. I mean, I think part of the issue here is, um, first of all, recently when, I mean, Israel now, in fact, many ways has walls all around, um, much larger. I think that they are, there are attacks going on now and I think the question is how you establish a system whereby the Palestinians feel that they have some buy-in to what is going on and, and that some of the um, hostility and anger, uh, I believe, would disappear. And it would make it harder to mobilize uh, various groups among the Palestinians who are constantly into uh, arguing that they don't have legitimate rights. And the question would be is how the two states are set up. One of the things that Secretary Kerry has been involved in and that he asked me to help on, we just had a meeting about this, in terms of trying to figure out how to have a way that on, in a new state of Palestine there would be some economic viability. Part of the problem is that there's a whole generation of young people that don't have jobs. There needs to be, in a Palestinian state, economic investment and some uh, validity and buy-in to having a different future. I have to tell you, when I was secretary and I went on my first trip as secretary to Ramallah, I went to a school and a young man there asked me, what is my future? And I couldn't answer the question. And therefore, I think that part of what needs to happen is to get this youth cohort having jobs that has to come from a two-state solution and economic viability of a Palestinian state. Okay. Madam Maybe. Secretary, it's such an honor to hear from you today. Uh, my name is Evgenia Sidarius. I'm a Foreign Service Officer, and I joined the Foreign Service when you were Secretary. So my very first working one, my very first VIP visit was your visit to Thailand for the ASEAN Summit, and watching you sing with Alex Downer, Mambo <laughs> Number 5, was... My first formative experience yeah. as a foreign service officer. But in, in light of, of what we remember then, your very groundbreaking work in North Korea, can you give us your thoughts on the negotiations with Iran on the nuclear file? And if it goes well, what should be the next issue we broach with the Iranians? Should it be kind of containing okay. the IRGC? Should it be kind of their mucking around? You know, I mean, how would you approach this? First of all, let me say, various things that you never thought what you'd have to do as Secretary of State would be to sing uh, at And you were a, good. No, I mean, that was, it was, uh, Americans had, I was told when I first started that uh, it's required at this last dinner of the ASEAN, every country puts on a skit and somebody said, and America does really badly always. So this was <laughs> all. Um, on the more serious question, I think that um, the talks are going on right now in Vienna. I think there, and um, Under Secretary Sherman, who is there representing, was, uh, although it's his senior official, basically kind of saying that they're hopeful in terms of some of the things that have been laid down uh, at the moment. I think that there are 
um, viable options that are in the agreement in terms of the real question is the amount of enrichment that the Iranians can undertake and will they uh, stop in terms of uh, dismantling certain of their, uh, <clears throat> their plants and things. And so uh, I think it is worth pushing forward on it, but it is all has to be verifiable. That is the problem. The issue is how other, you were talking about one thing links to another. We have a diplomatic issue at this very moment. The person that was named to represent Iran at the UN uh, was one of the hostage takers in 1979, and we have just turned down the visa application. And so the question is how that kind of thing then impacts the um, negotiator in Vienna, and also one of the things that we somehow forget are the domestic politics of Iran. And Rouhani uh, is uh, theoretically a moderate, how he operates within um, a difficult domestic environment um, and responds to this and then does not look as though he's given away the entire Iranian um, negotiating position. But I think that the United States and the P5 plus one are in a pretty good position if we keep pushing and try to make sure that it's verifiable. It does have an effect also on North Korea. I mean, and North Korea vice versa. But I personally believe that it is worth going forward uh, with the Iranian talks and pushing uh, and trying to figure out how much space Rouhani really has uh, and, and verifiable. I mean, the verifiable part is the most important aspect, not to be fooled. Good evening, Madam Secretary. My name is Jesse Perez, and I'm a uh, Master's in Liberal Arts uh, Studies uh, program here at Dartmouth. Uh, my question for you, generally speaking, is what are your thoughts and insights in terms of American statescraft being, certainly because we are a war-fatigued country, uh, more militarized in the character and nature of our statescraft? Do you think that over the past uh, 10 or 12 years, or 10 or, 10 or 20 years, that um, American foreign policy or the Department of Peace in this particular case has lost power, relatively speaking, to much of the conversations that revolve around, uh, you know, military issues? And if so, how do you think it's going to evolve over time? Well, I think that, um, as I said, there are the, a variety of tools that are out there, um, and uh, having used force uh, when the Clinton administration was in office, ultimately after a great deal of diplomacy uh, in terms of Bosnia and Kosovo and not having it work, um, of then using the threat of force and then using diplomacy to use force and then um, using diplomacy when force was over, I think you need that kind of mixture, but you don't try to use force as your main tool. Uh, what I was really troubled by, I do believe that the uh, American model in terms of talking about our values and how we operate is something that is very important. The United States is better off uh, when other countries are stable and I happen to believe democratic and have market systems. Uh, and, and that's why I basically am an internationalist. But I'm worried about the militarization of policy and especially worried, as I mentioned, because I am chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, that with what happened in Iraq, it militarized democracy. Uh, and I think it undermined the whole concept of how we um, are able to put our values out there. I happen to believe that the United States is an exceptional nation, but I don't believe that exceptions should be made for us. And when we do things that undermine that particular value system, I think it hurts us. And the militarization of our policy, I think, has hurt. It is one of the things that President Obama, by making clear that he wanted to end Iraq and Afghanistan, is trying to make clear that we don't have to pursue our policies through military means. Uh, and so I agree with you. I think the problem is, to go back to my toolbox, there are not a lot of tools in there. And if you decide that you're never, you know, this is why presidents say all options are on the table. 
but the bottom line is not the first tool that you pick up, but there is this combination of force and diplomacy. So I've mentioned about the pin. General Shalikashvili gave it to me, and one of the times he and I were standing uh, outside the Situation Room, and Secretary Rubin came by and he said, aha, force and diplomacy. And Charlie said, yeah, and which is which? So uh, <laughs> the, the bottom line is that the Pentagon and the State Department have to figure out how to work together. Uh, and not, you can't just eschew the use of force, but I prefer uh, moving on the diplomatic track with force in the background. Can I just... Can I follow that up quickly? You spent a lot of time in the 90s uh, trying to uh, restore funding uh, at the State Department. There were a lot of very painful cuts. And uh, you, know, you talked about the toolbox. When I look at the toolbox, I always see a really big hammer and you know, maybe a really small pliers because we so underfund diplomacy. We're in a better place than we used to be. But um, you know, if, if you were um, president, um, what kind of, would you, inc would you like to see a, a State Department that had 10, 20, 30 billion dollars more? Because ultimately money is the key yeah. diplomatic tool and I don't think people always uh, appreciate that. And I think people don't understand the um, relative size of one budget versus mm -hmm. the other. So even though the Defense Department is under sequestration and the Budget Control Act, it has somewhere around $500 billion. And the State Department, in order to pay for the services of the, the diplomats and the buildings and the programs, has about $50 billion. Uh, a lot of people on the issue of foreign aid, for instance, um, if, if I'm not sure, not in this audience, but other audiences, if you ask, how much do you think goes for foreign aid, people will say 25% of the budget. And you say, well, so no, but how much would you really think it should be? And people say 10%, and you say it's 1%, less than 1%. And so in many ways, a tool that one needs when I talk about it's the economic assistance in some form or another is a very important tool, and there's not a lot of money that goes to it. And people think that Diplomats have fancy lives and go to a lot of parties, but the bottom line is the security of our buildings are important. Uh, and then having uh, foreign service officers and civil servants that, that are able to do the work. So it's disproportionate, and I think one could do a great deal. And it's very hard to explain. I have to say that going up to the Hill and asking for foreign assistance, these are two words that should never go together. Um, it's like selling some disease. So the bottom line is you have to say that this is good for our national security. It, it definitely helps us to be able to have that kind of money. Do you think the world has gotten more or less peaceful during your life? Mm. More or less peaceful? I wish, listening to your voice, that I could say it has. It is not in a strange way, there is no such thing, I don't believe in Cold War nostalgia, when in fact the US and the Soviet Union were facing each other with nuclear weapons, and when people like me were your age, we actually practiced going under our desks and being afraid of a nuclear attack. The bottom line is that uh, the world was dangerous, but there were rules, uh, and they, you, operated in a way that people knew what was going on. Now what I think has happened is there are an awful lot of factors out there that are hard to control and figure out. And a lot about the system doesn't work. And an awful lot of people are dying in a lot of places. Uh, some because their neighbors don't like them uh, or they are fighting over borders or something. And so if one looks at the world, um, it's not that peaceful. America is a very special place. Uh, we, I think, are blessed by having neighbors on both sides that are friendly and mostly oceans that protect us. And so the question is whether people in the United States care whether our other parts of the world are peaceful or not and whether problems out there come home to America. But you are going to grow up in a pretty tough neighborhood not neighborhood as much as the environment, and the rules aren't there. 
yet, and one hopes that there will be rules that will make it more peaceful. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us. So uh, my question has something to do with the U.S.-China relationship. So I've heard that in recent years, uh, in many Chinese people think that China should thank George W. Bush and Vladimir Putin equally because uh, the former started the war on terror and the latter took over Crimea, both of which essentially helped China to uh, buy almost two more decades of time to further rise economically and militar <coughs> militarily. So and when America was busy dealing with other issues. So I'm just wondering, uh, my question is, how do you see the impact of this kind of thinking on President Obama's uh, pivot back to Asia policy and the future of U.S.-China relationship? I think that the U.S.-China relationship is the most important relationship of the 21st century. Uh, it is a huge country with a huge population and um, um, a reform a system that is trying to reform, and they are, you can decide, either our competitors or our partners, they're a little bit of both, uh, but I think it is the major relationship. And um, one of the things is the United States is an Atlantic and a Pacific power. I think it was very appropriate when President Obama was talking about rebalancing, um, and he is now going to go visit Asia. He had a meeting with President Xi Jinping in terms of trying to develop some kind of a new model of our relationship. Uh, I do think that um, the way you stated it is interesting in that we have been absorbed with other things. Uh, there are real questions as to what lesson uh, the Chinese will draw from Crimea. Um, I've been reading some articles where they think, aha, Taiwan. So um, the bottom line is, what are the lessons? They also. And part of the problem with dealing with terrorism is that some countries designate people as terrorists who really aren't. They are people that just object, like the Uyghurs or something. So I think that the Chinese are reading what is going on in a variety of places carefully, but basically the U.S.-Chinese relationship is absolutely crucial. And we have to figure out we are linked economically in a number of ways, uh, and we also we would like to see them take a more responsible role globally in order to manage some of the issues that uh, that young woman asked about, mm -hmm. is how to realize that by cooperating we can deal on some of the issues in other parts of the world. But it is just flat out, I would say, the most important relationship. Thank you. One question, okay. Hi, my name is Justin Moffitt, and my question's in regard to the toolbox, the diplomatic toolbox that you were talking about. Um, what is the role, would you say, of um, using red lines, as President Obama did most recently with the Syrian conflict, and how that might change, how the United States might be able to respond? And then also, what is the role of Congress um, in regards to being able to um, effectively and, and, and act in a time-sensitive um, situation as we were this past summer? Yeah. I think one of the things, and let me say, here I've been talking for quite a long time and I haven't blamed the media for anything yet. Um, <laughs> so I think that one of the problems that does happen with the 24-7 news cycle is, and we've both been in the government in terms of having some response. If you don't answer right away, then the, whatever administration is accused of being indecisive. And if you provide an answer, uh, like the red line, uh, it, you know, why you are decisive, and then the problem is, how do you live up to it? I know in our own experience, I, I know this from, from we promised um, in Bosnia in response to Congress that we would be out in a year, and we weren't. And so I learned something, which is that I think it's a mistake to have deadlines or red lines uh, that are, because it becomes a gun to your own head. So, but it's very hard to stay away from saying something dramatic when you are always accused of not saying whatever, you, you didn't answer strongly enough. That is a real issue. Um, and if CNN can make breaking news for three weeks <clears throat> out of an airplane, I mean, they are just looking for something. Um, so that is, that is an issue. The role about Congress that you said, I think, is very, very important. According to the Constitution, Congress is an equal power of the government. 
And the way it is set up, uh, depending upon what course one takes, is called invitation to struggle. They have a role. And part of the thing that happens is the timing of the congressional role and how the um, other foreign audiences actually hear what is being said. So on the issue, for instance, on Iran that was asked earlier, um, and their discussions about reimposing sanctions, that has uh, some, I would say, negative effect in terms of some of the, the discussions. Or when Congress puts automatic sanctions on, we have a very uh, rough relationship with Pakistan, partially because there are automatic sanctions that came on over a nuclear issue or the Musharraf coup. And so instead of being cooperative, I think that there is this struggle that goes on. But Congress, and that's why we need to have better information between Congress and the executive branch. But it is a co-equal branch of government, and the Constitution says so, and the question is, whether the members of Congress actually do their homework. It's very interesting that some members of Congress are really proud that they don't have passports. Not really helpful in terms of trying to deal with uh, international issues. Okay. I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, uh, end it there, but I did want to say I want to apologize to those who are still online, and I'm, I'm sorry that we can't get all the questions. And I did want to thank you again, Madam Secretary, for coming here today. and I. I particularly want to thank you, and everyone should know that you've been a real trooper today. You've met already with faculty, with students, with postdocs, and with faculty, students, postdocs, and the public now. And um, you've been absolutely fabulous. You know, the John Sloan Dickey Center is named for one of Dartmouth's great presidents, John Sloan Dickey, who incidentally was a State Department man. Yeah. And at a, at a critical time, uh, at, at the end of World War II and the beginning of the post-war period, and he argued forcefully for engagement and left a strong imprint on many, many Dartmouth grads, particularly with his famous remark that the world's troubles are your troubles and that there's nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of anyone who embodies that kind of moral imperative more than you do. And well, so it's been and wonderful. And I want to thank you for, we were partners <laughs> in a lot of work, your service to the United States government and how lucky Dartmouth is to have oh, you well, here. Thank you because very much. Because I think practitioners <laughs> make it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.